Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. For those of you that like to get to the juicy story where you have the straightforward Bigfoot encounter, well, I've got that for you on this channel right now. But the full stories are really worth listening to. And I've got them listed at the bottom because really just the Bigfoot encounter without the whole experience from the beginning to the middle and the end is really worth listening to. But if you just want to get to the juicy encounter that people have sent in to me, by all means, here are a few examples of them right now on my channel. So get straight into the business, shall we? And let's get started. I pulled over to the side of the road and parked my truck. And then I went to bed to get some sleep. I was awoken a couple of hours later to these huge slapping sounds on the side of my truck and my very clear, a very clear sound of something being dragged on the ground. It sounded like a very large foot of some kind. I got up immediately to see what was actually going on. I used my flashlight to get a better view, but I saw absolutely nothing. Then there was a loud clamouring sound as if something was trying to get on top of my container. I was sure I heard something walking all over the container, and it sounded like a herd of rhinos had been let loose. Whatever this thing was, it sounded heavy. I was so terrified by then, but then the noise just suddenly seemed to stop, as suddenly as it had started, and everything became exceedingly quiet. So I returned to bed, very perplexed about what had just happened, but frankly far too tired to care. I woke up at about five o'clock that morning, and luckily it was getting lighter outside, but I still took a flashlight with me, as I needed to relieve myself before my journey. And then as I was coming back from my ablutions, I suddenly saw something that caught my attention on top of my shipping container. It looked like a massive shaggy coat, or lots of shaggy co coats piled on top of each other. My first reaction is, what the heck is that? It looked like someone had offloaded tons and tons of their dirty fur coats that they no longer wanted or needed and were way too lazy to take to the dumpster, so they had piled on top of my shipping ca container in a mangled heap. I wouldn't have been surprised at all if that was the case, because people were very weird. As I got close to my truck, I could hear this loud snoring sound. And then I realised very suddenly that this whole lot of fleecy coats was in fact one fleecy coat that belonged to a strange creature that was lying on top of my container. I noticed a few dried but bloody stains on the side of my truck that looked like drag marks. Whatever this creature was, it must have injured one of its feet. And that must have been the very creature that had clambered on top of my container during the night, making all those strange sounds. I could detect a very offensive smell in the air that smelt very rough like stale urine and perspiration and cheesy trainers rolled into one. I decided to get back into my truck and just hope that whatever this creature was, that it would move off on its own accord later on. I did not know what it was, but I had no desire to tackle it, and so I chose to move on my way with my journey, and that's exactly what I did. I drove straight for about six solid hours, and then I pulled over to the side of the road to relieve myself once again behind a large tree I'd spotted. Another unfortunate side effect of being a trucker. I looked towards the top of my shipping container to see if that fleecy creature was still there. I secretly hoped it had gone. And there it was. Suddenly I saw this big shaggy form moving, and then it rose up on two hind legs. The creature was colossal and was at least eight foot tall, seven hundred pounds, and four and a half feet wide. It had the most enormous shoulders I've ever seen, and a large cone-shaped head. It was covered from head to toe with long silvery grey hair, and I realised immediately that I was seeing an elderly Bigfoot who had injured his foot very badly. I could see him dragging it on the top of the container, and I heard him made a few painful grunts, as if his foot was giving him a lot of pain. He stood erect on the container like an imposing statuesque monster. I watched the Bigfoot study the view from the motorway that stretched back into vast areas of natural forest. 
He seemed to be getting his coordinates sorted in his head, judging by the way he was studying the terrain. And then he seemed satisfied about where he was. And then he bounced off the container with the agility of a domestic cat, making sure not to land on his injured foot. I watched him jump over the very high guardrail, as if it was nothing, walk through a clear clearing, down an embankment, towards a wood full of pine trees, full of pine trees, and then he was gone. He moved with a flawless fluidity, despite the impediment of his injured foot, which he dragged behind him precariously. I watched in awe, amazed to realise that this creature had clearly hitchhiked a lift with me on the back of my shipping container. I marvelled at the intelligence of this creature for thinking outside of the box to get to a different location faster, as I imagine his injured foot was holding him back. These creatures are like nomads that move from one place to another following waterways or electric pylons. That was my guess. I was amazed to realise that this Bigfoot was indeed real, and not the legendary creature I had often believed him to be. There were other truckers who claimed to have seen Bigfoots before, but now that I had seen him, I knew he was real. Not once during my observations of this strange creature did I actually feel any fear, but all I felt was awe and admiration for this lofty, majestic creature that had crossed my path in such a spectacular way. My story begins when one day I heard gunshots coming from my woods, followed by these loud audible screams of someone who was clearly in distress. Using my binoculars I surfed the area around my woods, and that was when I saw a man running through my cornfields as fast as he possibly could, and he was screaming at the top of his lungs, and the sound he was making was so terrifying it literally caused the hair on the back of my neck to stand on end. I was wondering what on earth was happening to the seemingly frightened, petrified man, whom I suspected very quickly was a poacher, as he was clutching a rifle and looking frenetically back over his shoulder towards the forest every few seconds. Even though I was watching this drama unfold from a distance, I could literally feel this man's terror. It was that palpable, even though I was watching through my binoculars. Then suddenly I saw this threatening creature emerge out of the dusky shadows, and there he was, a creature the likes of such that I've never had the privilege of seeing before in my entire life. Truly this thing was like a Herculean, bipedal ape-like giant. I know of no other way to describe this jumbo-sized beast. He was covered completely in long waves of shaggy brown-grey hair that flowed in the wind as he moved his powerful, imposing, majestic form with a masterful fluidness and agility that was unlike anything I have ever witnessed before. At a strapping nine foot tall, eight hundred pounds and five feet wide, he was racing towards the terrified man on his long, agile legs, running with the majesty and speed of a cheetah with five-foot strides. It was like watching a scene from Natural Geographic unfold on television, before me with seamless fluidity, which had a bewitching hold over me, as I watched in stunned amazement, hardly daring to believe what I was actually seeing. The seemingly small form of a swelt man in a white shirt was staggering and shaking violently from terror, and was so uncoordinated and dithery if you did not know better, you would think he was drunk. He looked behind him frantically as the hairy humanoid got ever closer with every step. Although everything seemed to happen incredibly quickly, it felt as if I was watching everything in slow motion. I continued to watch in horror as the man barely made it to his bright red jeep in time. It appeared that fear had seemingly incapacitated his every move, so he struggled to run forwards, pushing his legs as if he was treading water. He finally made it back to his car, and his fingers were wobbling violently as clumsily he managed to open his car door, throwing himself onto the seat, slamming the door behind him and revving up the engine, but failing to get it started on his first futile attempts, which stalled and prolonged his desperate anguish to escape. 
this incredible hulk of a titanic-sized creature lunged towards the back of the car like a lion mounting its prey from the rear. It proceeded to lift the back of the jeep so that the front of the car was perching precariously on its two wheels. I kid you not, this giant creature looked as if he was picking up a toy car in his hands. He made the jeep look like it weighed next to nothing in his huge sausage-sized fingers, almost like he was opening a can of tuna. I was boggled by such an extraordinary display of super robustness, brawn and strength. The creature let out a thunderous roar that sent the fear of God diving through every fibre of my being. Believe me, I've never heard a roar like that before, and it truly made a lion's roar seem like a pussycat by comparison, and I am not kidding. He then begrudgingly released his hold on the back of the car, and it slammed to the ground, bouncing on the back wheels. I could see the rubescent, blushing, petrified face of the driver as he started the engine and hightailed it down the dirt road in his car as fast as he possibly could. I doubted that he would ever be seen poaching on my land again. I watched the dark, shadowy form of the huge, giant creature retreating back into the forest, and he was shaking his fists angrily in an expression of incandescent rage. I knew that if that creature had wanted to kill that man, he would have done so effortlessly, and he would have done it now. It would have been nothing for him to prise him out of his car like an olive in a jar of brine. So in my opinion, he did not want this man anywhere near his turf, or hunting anywhere, any of the wildlife on my land. I truly think the creature had physically restrained himself from extracting the petrified man from his vehicle, and squeezing his head like a chicken egg so that the brains, so that his brains burst over the seats. Sorry for being so gruesome and graphic, but I truly sensed and believe that this is what he wanted to do. But perhaps a touch of humanity and compassion held him back. One of the young men finally spoke. He knew, said the man. Who knew what, I asked. The Bigfoot knew we were there to kill him. I am sure of it, he said. The others all nodded in agreement. He did know, they said. Mm -hmm. Go on, I urged them. What happened, and where are your rifles? We went into the woods, said the one man, who, was, with the help of a little brandy in his hot chocolate, had finally managed to gather some composure. Go on, I encouraged. We went into the woods, he repeated, and then we heard the sound. It was a strange, humming, esoteric sound that I cannot describe, because it was unlike anything I've ever heard before. We knew the noise was coming from the Bigfoot, that he was making the strange sound. I'm sure of it. It was hypnotic. It physically affected us, making our bodies feel uncoordinated and wobbly, and causing us to become light-headed. The next thing we knew was we were lying on the forest floor, waking up from a deep sleep, as if we'd come around from an anaesthetic after a long surgery. It felt like that. Go on, I said, watching the young man bursting into tears. I'm not a baby, he said, apologising profusely. I never, ever cry. But this creature, well, he's not of this world. He has supernatural powers. He reads minds. As we came around from our sleep-like state, the Bigfoot stood there towering over us with a look of intense hatred on his face. He had shredded our rifles to pieces and discarded all the bullets almost as if he knew exactly what our ammo does and what the bullets actually are. How is that possible? I mean, he's only an animal, isn't he? He then roared at us and started chasing us out of the woods, and we all felt it screaming in our heads, saying, Get out, or I will kill you and leave my deer alone. You all heard it, I asked. The young men nodded. We all heard exactly the same words in our heads, but they were spoken in our heads, and not audibly. You see what I mean, said the man? The creature is not of this world. No one can talk to you in your head like that. I mean, not without audible words. I will tell you one thing, said the young man. I admit I've been poaching for a while, now in places all over West Virginia, and often I felt I was being watched. I'm never ever going to hunt again, not after what I've experienced tonight. My poaching days are well and truly behind me.
Suddenly I heard the strange chattering sound and I looked up through my tears to see what was making that peculiar noise. The only thing I could liken the noise to was that to the sound of a monkey, but I saw nothing. Moggy was wagging his tail at something and letting out some excited yaks, so I threw him his bone which he started to chew with great gusto. The next thing I knew was that pretty blue flowers were being thrown at me, but where were they coming from? I did not know. Once again I looked around and saw nothing, but I kept hearing that strange chattering sound. I was sitting under a large oak tree, and I just so happened to look up, and there in the branches was a huge colossal creature, the likes of such that I have never seen before. At that time I'd never heard of Bigfoot because of living in New York. Creatures like that are not usually discussed. I could not make out what this creature actually was. It looked like it was half ape and half human and this thing was monstrously huge, but he had such a cheerful, funny disposition. I was not afraid of him at all. The creature bounded out of the tree now that I'd seen him, and sat down several yards away from me, eyeing me curiously with a keen interest and intrigue. He was covered from head to toe with hazelnut hair, and he must have weighed about six hundred pounds and been about seven feet tall. Every part of his body rippled with dense muscle, and I do remember he had huge shoulders and a very distinct bullet-shaped head, with virtually no neck to speak of. His long face was a dark brown colour and looked like dark shiny leather, and he had a very distinct brow ridge, very flat nose and sparkling brown eyes. I opened my ham sandwiches and threw him one. The creature discarded the bread and gobbled up the ham and tomato and then began to mimic me. When I proceeded to eat my sandwich, he was so funny that I started choking on my sandwich, and I was laughing so much, and then he started imitating my choking, and then he started imitating all my laughing, which made me laugh all the more. I do remember I do not remember ever laughing this much. Pumped up by my enthusiasm, the creature decided to show off by swinging from one tree to another, giving me amazing display of his acrobatic prowess and his incredible agility. He did strange twists and turns that were so seamless that he would have made a ballet dancer appear cl clumsy. I began to clap, and then he imitated my clapping with an animated expression on his face. I was literally rolling on the forest floor, my stomach aching because I was laughing so much as his imitations of me were absolutely hilarious. The creature then began to throw some more blue flowers at me, like he would throw confetti at a bride. How do you know I love blue, I asked the creature, knowing full well the creature didn't understand my words, but he regarded me with very inquisitive eyes, and chattered away jubilantly. He was so beautiful, and my heart was flooded with this incredible warmth. For the first time in ages I was feeling incredibly happy. I threw my packet of salted potato crisps at the creature. He played with the packet, tossing it up and down like a ball, catching it every time. He then threw it a fair distance away, and then began to catch it. He was so majestic, powerful and agile, and was so beautiful to watch, because his movements were seamlessly graceful. After a while he opened the crisps, and after sniffing, examining and tasting the crisps, he dived into them with an exuberant gusto, demolishing them all in a few seconds. He licked his chops appreciatively, and once the bag was empty, he put on exaggerated sad expression on his dark leathery face, causing his wrinkles on his brow ridge to deepen significantly. He then showed me the empty bag, and he looked very, very sad. He surreptitiously pointed to my two bananas on the ground, and I threw them to him, and he munched them away eagerly with the skins on, observing me with an inquisitive curiosity all the while. I started to laugh. You want more, don't you? I said. That's all I've got but I'll bring you some more tomorrow. I got up to leave the woods and waved to the creature. See you in the morning, I said with a big smile on my face. That evening I ate a hearty meal and for the first time in ages I felt as if the heaviness had dissipated. I did feel lighter and happier. Every day the hairy ape-like creature was in the woods waiting for me and even Moggy, my dog, had grown attached to him. On this occasion I brought the creature a hairbrush and to my amazement he absolutely adored being groomed. It took me about three long hours to brush out his long, tangled, human-like hair, but he chatted away happily while I did this, sometimes letting out a rather uncomfortable cry when I got to a tangled part of his hair. 
I guided the creature finally, once I'd finished, to the shimmering lake, so that he could see his reflection in the water. I must admit his hair just gle gleamed in the midday sun, and the creature was amazed by how he looked. He studied his reflection closely and stroked his mane in awe, and he kept saying, Oop! 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 as if he just couldn't believe how fantastic he looked. He also let out a few happy whooping sounds, and then proceeded to brush his own hair all on his own, while admiring his reflection. I think he could not believe the transformation, and he loved his hairbrush. I also brought the creature a Rubex cube, which I thought he might like, and I was not wrong, he loved it, and he understood the game immediately. I struggled to understand those cubes and to get those colours together, but this creature had absolutely no difficulty at all, and when he watched me struggling away with it, he was very puzzled that I found it at all challenging. Every time I went into the woods we played together, and as weird as it sounds, it felt as if I had made the most amazing friend, because he really was such a special creature. One day we gathered some very late berries together. The hairy humanoid stuffed his mouth with the berries, and his face became very fat and puffy. When we went to relax under the oak tree, the creature emptied out his cheek pockets, much like a squirrel does, and proceeded to enjoy eating the berries one by one. It was really amusing to watch. I must admit it was with great sadness that I did finally have to leave Tennessee and say goodbye to my mountain friend, whom I've never ever forgotten, and remember with such a keen fondness. It was truly this awe-inspiring creature that brought me the light to my dark world and hope to my hopelessness, and truly if I had not met this creature, I doubt that I'd be here today to tell you my story. When I got back home to New York and did some research, I realised that Puffin was a Bigfoot. I also learnt that many people had experienced terrifying encounters with these creatures, and for them I'm truly sorry, but Puffin, he was an altogether different creature, a unique one, I'm in no doubt about that. I could feel, sense and taste evil, almost as if it had been fumbling, almost as if I'd been fumbling around the devil's lair, and he was about to come out after me with his pitchfork in tow. Let's get out of here, I said to Joel. Now! Joel did not answer me. He stood still, like a motionless statue, seemingly frozen to the spot, and he was pointing towards some saplings in the thick, thick undergrowth that appeared to be swaying menacingly backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and then suddenly between some of the open spaces in the leaves I, got a de I could detect a very large, dark, shadowy form that at first glance looked remarkably like a bear. Suddenly a small sapling was pulled towards one side like a large curtain, and staring at us through the undergrowth was an enormous cone-shaped face that looked remarkably ape-like in appearance, with very deep-set, dark, hostile eyes that were so filled with hateful rage. The creature was straddled on all fours, and then he rose up on two feet, towering at an impressive nine feet. It started pounding its monstrous chest and stamping its enormous muscular legs in an act of incandescent rage. The creature was Herculean in size. He looked like he'd stepped out of a monster movie and taken on physical form. It was without doubt a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, and it was covered with loose fleecy dark hair that looked exactly like dredgelocks, and it was very matted and tangled and smelt incredibly rank. Now I knew where the foul smell emanated from. The creature was wearing the smell, and he began to huff and puff and make these dreadful, deep, guttural, irate grunts that sounded distinctly ape-like. He continued to beat and pound his chest in a very dominant stance, and he began to curl back his mouth to reveal a set of pearly, huge, human-like teeth, and then the creature began to roar like a lion. The only problem is a lion's roar would have been intimidated. This would have been far more intimidating than any lion's roar, let me tell you. He proceeded to reach for some hefty tree branches and splintered them in front of us as if to say, This is what I'm going to do to you. It was like he was taunting, deriding, heckling and teasing us to engender fear in every fibre of our being. And his tactics were working brilliantly. We were so terrified, we barely knew what to do. Never before had I ever felt so feeble and so pathetic 
in all my life. The capricious Bigfoot reminded me of those out-of-control erratic elephants you get in Africa when they come into musk because of their high levels of testosterone that seemed to drive them to heightened levels of belligerent aggression. He was behaving exactly like this. Walk slowly, I commanded Joel. Whatever you do, make sure you do not run. Avoid any eye contact with the creature. Keep looking down and act submissive. Joel and I focused on the ground, avoiding the creature's gaze, and turned around, walking away very, very slowly. The creature continued to roar, and then he started hurling stones at us, provoking us to run, so that he could pursue us and either harm us or kill us. Keep walking, Joel, I commanded. Keep walking. Don't run. Don't run. Joel, don't run. It was the most onerous thing that I've ever done, walking away slowly, because believe me, it was so hard. I wanted to run away as fast as I possibly could, almost as much as this creature clearly wanted to tear us apart, limb from limb. But first he wanted to get us to run. I was certain of that. I could feel those cold, dark eyes burning through us, and that hatred was so palpable you could physically feel it. Even as we walked away, we were both physically shaking. I cannot do this, whispered Joel. I need to run. I've got to get away from this monster. I can't keep walking like this. I just can't. There's no way. I've got to run. If you run, you are dead, I said. He wants you to run because he gets off on it. You will be giving him what he wants. Don't run. Keep walking. We could hear the creature behind us and he was huffing and puffing and making these terrifying grunts and his breathing was so heavy you could almost feel it at the back of your neck. Joel just suddenly lost it. He couldn't take it any more. He just had to run from the creature as fast as he could. And I watched him sprinting away and I groaned. Oh! The creature went dashing after Joel at lightning speed on his long, agile, hairy legs, passing me in the pursuit of his friend. Not even realising that I was there, he was so intent on getting to Joel. Joel was now living on borrowed time. I knew it, and he must have known it. I had to help him, but I did not have a rifle with me, so I acquired a broken tree limb that was big enough for me to use, and then I started running after the Bigfoot that was pursuing Joel. My heart was pounding in my chest violently, and I was living on adrenaline surging that surged through my body so fast that it intensified my steps to lightning speed. I myself could not believe how fast I was actually running. The Bigfoot grabbed my friend with his powerful arms, straddling him by the throat with one of his hefty elbows. I knew that one click of the neck to the left, or one click to the right, and it would be lights out for my friend forever and ever. It would be over for him. The Bigfoot was so focused on pursuing Joel and killing him that he did not realise that I was standing literally a foot behind him. And I dropped my tree limb and picked up the a large rock I found on the ground and I threw it upwards, because the Bigfoot was very tall, to the back of his head with brute force, aiming it at the creature. My aim was spot on and incredulous, even if I say so myself. I had hit him in the back of the head incredibly hard, and the huge wacky blow caused the creature's head to wobble precariously. The Bigfoot turned around to look at me through dazed, fuzzy eyes that had almost lost their focus completely. It would seem that he had become disorientated and dizzy, and his anger was temporarily suppressed because he clearly didn't know where he was. He released his grip on Joel, and his eyes rolled in the back of his head, and he looked more and more confused, and he certainly lost his faculties for a moment, and could not remember who or where he was. 
I think the head bang had definitely concussed him. While the Bigfoot was in a mental stupor, stupor, a seemingly whirling maze of blurring stars rocketing in his head like a flurry of colourful fireworks, I took my opportunity to get Joel to move. Run, Joel! Run now! I shouted to him and took full advantage of the Bigfoot's unstable mental condition, and Joel and I began to run as fast as we possibly could from the creature, and we managed to make it back to my jeep and we sped away as fast as we could, not daring to look back. One day it happened all over again. I was playing in the woods and I sensed something or someone was staring at me, and I knew without a shadow of a doubt that my instincts were a hundred percent correct. After all, my experiment had proved that. I immediately went to look behind every single tree and every available hiding place, but there was nothing there. Then I turned my attention to looking into the trees, and as I looked up into an oak, I suddenly saw a little cute face staring back at me through the branches. But what was this creature, I wondered? I'd never encountered an animal like this before. The animal was about three foot tall and covered from head to toe with long auburn hair, only its face was completely hairless. It really rather reminded me a lot of orangutan, because it also had those typical long monkey arms, and his humanoid face had a very definite monkey look, especially around the eyes. My heart was fluttering with his excitement as I observed this unique creature that, although exceedingly curious, did appear to be painfully shy. For a while our eyes locked, and I observed that he had the most beautiful yellow-brown rusty eyes that I'd ever seen. I started to climb the oak tree, so that I could be in close proximity to the creature, and as I did this it appeared to be laughing at me. I could see amusement in its brown, sparkling eyes. I realised that my clumsy, ungainly climbing had made this little creature laugh, because compared to a monkey's agility I must have looked like a bungling idiot. Suddenly the little creature became consumed by confidence, seemingly overcoming its natural reticence and it proceeded to show me how to climb up and down a tree properly, and so I tried to emulate it, but every time I did, the creature appeared to snort with laughter because of my cloddish manoeuvres. I grinned at the creature because I was beginning to realise how gawky and pathetic I looked. It was in that moment our friendship was born, and there was no turning back. It did not seem to matter that we were of two different species, although my friend did have extreme human-like qualities, like intelligence, humour, and a huge sense of adventure. We would chase each other around the woods, but every time he swang up on the trees with his long arms and twisted himself up into those branches in all kinds of impressive acrobatic manoeuvres, I knew that I had lost the game, because he was so agile and fast, and I could never compete with such nimbleness. I would visit my friend in the woods all the time, and I do not recall a time in my life when I was happier and more content. I had developed a bond with this incredible creature, but I did not know where he was from or what kind of species he actually was, nor did I know why he was always sitting on the top of the very same oak tree every time I went to visit him. I did wonder who and where his parents were, and why they left him all on his own for such a long period of time. You see, my communication with my friend was never verbal, but with the miming gestures we more or less pretty much understood each other, and I got the very distinct impression his mother looked on the oak tree as a kind of nursery and a place where her youngling could sleep in the trees and remain very safe. I'm pretty certain the creature was actually nocturnal. Well, that's the impression I got. One day as the two of us were climbing a tree in the woods and eating the bananas I'd brought with me, which was something I always did, much to the delight of my friend. Suddenly I heard a strange, shrill whistle. At first I thought it was a call from a bird that I had heard in the woods on many times before. But to my amazement, my hairy friend duplicated exactly the same whistle, as if answering or returning a call. It was then that I heard a thunderous sound, and there she was, larger than life, stepping out of the shadows into the full light of the morning sun, with the shafts of sunlight causing her auburn hair to literally gleam. I knew at once she was the mother of my friend, but she was an extraordinary, remarkable-looking specimen that would have looked impressive, bracing the, gracing the covers of National Geographic. 
She was powerful, majestic, lofty, and magnificent. At least I thought she was. Many others might choose to disagree. She towered like a forest giant at about eight feet tall, and was about four and a half feet wide, and seven hundred pounds. She had the most incredible muscular definition that I could see beneath the scantier hair over her midriff, and it moved when she did. Her Herculean-sized shoulders would make those of an Olympic swimming champion look puny and pathetic by contrast. I noticed that her head was cone-shaped, with what appeared to be an almost human-like pinky-brown hairless face, a prominent brow ridge that was extensively wrinkled, a big pug-like nose, and a very deep-set pair of lively brown eyes that sparkled with merriment. When the creature saw me perching precariously on a branch next to her youngling, I could swear she smiled, as I distinctly saw the corners of her mouth twitch upwards, and her large white human-like teeth remained fixed. I also sensed she was somewhat benumbed to see me in the branches so congenially contented and at ease with her son. My hairy friend climbed down the branches, as did I, and he ran into his mother's arms while she held him, running her monstrous huge hands through his soft hair and tearing apart any tangled strands with her sausage-like fingers. When she did this, she stared at me curiously, almost as if she was studying every detail of the Picasso painting and deciding whether she liked it or not. I'm glad to say by the twinkle in her eyes, I felt almost certain I had won and met with her seal of approval. She started chattering to her youngling in a very strange tongue, all the while scrutinizing me with a keen and curious interest. I could tell by the way my friend was chattering excitedly to her that he was telling her how much he actually liked me, and she reacted with a very pleased demeanor, as if delighted that her sprog had finally found a playmate. She indicated for me to follow her, and all three of us went to the creek together, and while the mother was wading in the water, my hairy friend and I were splashing each other and throwing pebbles. Suddenly I heard this thunderous no noise like a herd of rhinos coming towards us. It was such a monstrously heavy sound that you could literally feel the ground vibrate beneath you. Then I heard this incredible roar that was so terrifying I froze to the spot, incapacitated by fear, as the hair on the back of my neck stood up on end. Then I saw him, like the most monstrous, imposing predator, fixated on his kill with a relentless valour. He was wading in the water angrily towards me with a gargantuan tree-trunk-sized -trunk pair of legs and resolute five-feet strides. Before I knew it, he seized me in his monstrous arms and hurled me into the air like a Catherine wheel, where I went spinning and somersaulting and then plunging into the murky depths of the water. Once again the monstrous giant came clamouring towards me and reaching for my head almost to asphyxiate me under the water, at least that's what it felt like. The next thing I knew he released his suffocating hold from me and I came out of the water like an otter but desperately gasping for breath. I'm in no doubt that the big male seemed to be trying to kill me or at least to put me in my place. I could see the female creature screaming at the male and pounding her fists into his chests. He stood there like a statue, frozen in time, receiving the full wrath of her furious physical altercation. I saw her pull his ears that were buried beneath his ear hair and slapping the sides of his cone-shaped head very fiercely, all the while chattering in a very disapproving high-pitched voice. Once again I was reminded of that praying mantis as this female had a powerful hold over the male during their copulation. It would seem that this male humanoid was literally under her spell, willing to do her every bidding, even if it meant being humiliated and chastised in front of me. She let out another scream at him that was so piercing it went right through me like a jackknife. She then pointed towards the bank, and I watched this humiliated thousand-pound male humanoid paddling away into the water, walking towards the bank. He then sheepishly and obediently squatted down, watching us with puzzled, somewhat exasperated look on his hairless face, as if to say, Woman, you just can't understand them. I noticed he was watching me curiously 
scratching his head in a gesture of thoughtful repose, as if wondering what on earth his little son actually saw in me. I, re I remember feeling in that moment that I truly was safe, and relief washed over me like a foaming wave. But even so, the male was a deadly predator. Of that I was no in no doubt, who would kill in a heartbeat, if given in the opportunity. In the weeks that followed, I would play with my hairy humanoid friend, under the watchful eye of his mother, whom I did see. When I did see the male, he would make a few unfriendly grunts, but he was never very aggressive, and began to accept my relationship with his son. One day, when I went to play in the woods, the female humanoid ape and her son howled for a few moments, and that was a bit odd. And then they both gave me something. My friend gave me a collection of pretty bird's feathers, and the female gave an elk skin, and then out of the shadows came the male creature, who presented me with a pair of deer antlers. In that moment I knew they were leaving, probably, probably because they never stayed in one place for very long. They both, they all proceeded to tap me on the shoulders, and then they were gone. Years and years passed by, and then when I got into my early thirties I saw my friend again. I could hardly believe it, but I recognised him immediately. This time he was a big male. He had become substantial in size, easily at over a thousand pounds. He looked lofty, majestic, masterful and beautiful. He was with a female at his side and a little youngling that I imagined was his child. He came out of the shadows to say hello, and it was a joyful reunion. I believe he was passing through and wanted to introduce me to his young family, and I could tell he was ecstatically happy. We spent the whole day at the creek, and it was like we became children all over again and forgot that we were adults, and let go of that adult persona. Even the adult female lost her shyness and awkwardness and was overcome by childlike behaviour, and we were all splashing around in the creek together and throwing pebbles. After a while the creature became exceedingly hungry and started to fish with sharpened pieces of timber, and they were all efficient at catching fish, and even the little Bigfoot made me look like a prize buffoon, because when I tried to use a timber to strike a fish, I missed every time, much to the amusements of the Bigfoots, who were actually laughing at me quite a lot. They started to mimic my lack of coordination in various miming acts, and even I was laughing, because it was clearly funny to watch. I was really incredibly clumsy. I took the creatures to my fire pit, and proceeded to prepare a fire, and they watched in awe, making all kinds of animated, feverish grunting sounds, and when I finally lit the fire, they all went, Ooh! Ooh! I then proceeded to flavour the fish with seasoning, and wrap it carefully in foil, and we cooked it and ate it. I think they loved how buttery the fish tasted, and the way the hot meal melted in their tongue. They ate everything apart, even the heads, only leaving behind the fish bones. I then cooked some beef patties and bacon on the grill, and they got very excited about the bacon, and were grunting zealously. They reveled in the salty smoked flavour and the delicious smell, and they smacked their lips in ardent appreciation, and so we all relaxed by the fire, eating and observing the crackling yellow-orange flames, folding, bending, and burning the coals, and the timber, while we reposefully enjoyed the starry night. I had my guitar handy, and I played some I played the creatures some of my favourite songs, and they were enraptured by my music, and they were swaying their heads backwards and forwards as I sang. They were particularly fond of the B minus notes, and my friend was tapping a piece of timber on a stone on the edge of the fire pit in time to my guitar. My Bigfoot friend finally got up, tapped me on the shoulders twice, as did the female and the youngling, and I watched them go, with tears flowing down my cheeks, because in my heart I knew I would never ever see them again.
So there we are. That's the juicy bits of our stories tonight. I personally think you should go back and listen to the whole story because it makes it so much more exciting because then you learn all about where it happened, the location, and all about the fabulous characters involved in the story. And that makes the story so much more gripping. But as I say, so go down to the description and then click on to the YouTube link and then you will hear the whole story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.